Okay, so welcome everybody. And this is a talk I put together about some very new news in astronomy, which is the discovery in January that was announced of the gravitational wave background. And to set the scene, first of all, I'm going to talk about the cosmic microwave background, which we've known about for many years, was discovered in the uh, 60s, I believe, late 60s. And the cosmic microwave background, this image here, this rugby ball shape, uh, shows the variations in intensity of the afterglow from 3,800 years after the Big Bang. So when the universe was very young, but not right from the very, very beginning, this was the point at which the temperature of the universe dropped to about the same as the surface of a red giant star and finally became uh, transparent to visible light. Now, we always see it as that rugby ball shape because what they've really done is unwrapped the two hemispheres of a sphere that uh, is what we see looking in all possible directions. So another way of showing the same is, is as two circles like this, but that, that rugby ball shape is the same. It's the equivalent of what they do when they take a uh, globe of the earth and map all the continents out and unwrap it onto a, a flat sheet really. <laughs> and this story all started with these two gentlemen, Penzias and Wilson in uh, Bell Labs who were worrying about a pesky noise that they couldn't get rid of in their communication system and they were using the big horn antenna that you see behind them in the picture there to study the, the source of this interference, which seemed to be getting into their equipment. Um, and it didn't seem to matter which direction they pointed their antenna, they were always getting the same noise coming into the system. Eventually they uh, were put in touch with a couple of astronomers from the theoretical side uh, from the West Coast who had predicted exactly this sort of effect of a noise in the radio part of the spectrum that would be left over from the Big Bang. And the two compared notes and the discovery was made of this microwave radiation that seems to be coming from all over the sky at a temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin. So very cold radiation, but not uh, sort of uh, emitted as such. When it was emitted, it was emitted at a temperature of around 3000 degrees, the temperature of red hot. And what, of course, has happened in the intervening time is that it has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. The amazing fit between the theory and the data is shown in this graph here. The <coughs> red dots are the intensity of the radiation according to the microwave frequency and a perfect black body radiator would produce the green line. So it, the, the fit is extraordinary. And when we say 2.7 degrees, that's the, measured by measuring where the peak is. And as uh, a, a body gets hotter, the peak in the radiation moves to higher and higher energies. And so it sweeps up through infrared and into the visible part of the spectrum or even beyond. But this was emitted in the spectrum uh, as red light fundamentally at red and infrared but because of the expansion of the universe the wavelength has been stretched by a factor approaching uh, 2000 times and uh, that has reduced the energy of the light from the uh, visible part of the spectrum right down into the fairly low energy low temperature equivalent microwaves now we'll come back at the end of the talk to the cosmic microwave background because it links in to the subject that we're really going to talk about today and that is gravity waves. Gravity waves are an entirely different form of transmitted energy. They're not carried by the electromagnetic force but by ripples in space-time. Einstein showed that a mass will create a curvature in space, um, as shown in the first picture here with the Earth creating a, a divot in the uh, 
shape of the fabric of space-time around it. But moving objects will create a moving uh, change in the space and accelerating objects can emit a gravity wave. And a good example of that is a pair of objects orbiting closely around each other that will emit a traveling gravity wave in the form of a spiral of radiation. And that gravity waves move at the speed of light. They, they are um, subject to the yeah. same laws of uh, general relativity. So they move at the same speed and they carry energy away from such situations. And so two objects such as a pair of neutron stars or as in the, the picture at the bottom, a pair of black holes orbiting each other will gradually lose energy as they radiate away this, this gravitational wave energy. And so they spiral inwards and eventually they collide and merge. There's a good animation here, a simulation of a pair of black holes orbiting each other and eventually merging. And it's on repeat, of course. And what we are looking at is the simulation of the black holes themselves as the dark regions in the center there, one big one and one small one, and the distortion of space time that they are creating as they spiral together, creating that rippling and shimmying look of the background of stars from behind them, um, showing how their gravity is distorting the fabric of space time. And you can also see the ripples almost traveling outwards until after the merger, when everything settles down, because the system becomes completely symmetrical at that point. And gravity waves are caused by an asymmetry in uh, accelerating uh, fields. They're also a little bit strange in that they aren't a, a dipole, as in a positive and a negative that we have with electromagnetism. They're a quadrupole field, which means that the oscillation is as shown in the little animation. Um, it's going from tall, thin to short, fat and back again. And so as a gravity wave passes through you, you would do the same thing. You become a bit taller and thinner and then a bit shorter and fatter um, as the wave passes through you. Um, and that shape is trying to be shown by the mesh diagram on the left there. It doesn't really matter, but it affects how you go about detecting them. And the way you do it is to take advantage of this quadrupole uh, field shape and you build a detector like LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravity Wave Observatory, which has these two four kilometer long arms uh, stretching away at right angles from the central laboratory. And a laser beam is generated in the central lab and split with a partially silvered mirror, half is sent down each arm to reflectors at the far end, and then the beam comes back and is recombined in the lab. In fact, it goes up and down the, the tube 72 times to increase that four kilometer path length dramatically. Uh, and that's in order to get enough sensitivity so that when a gravity wave passes through and makes one of the arms uh, stretch while the other one shrinks a bit due to that uh, quadrupole shape. Uh, it's inevitable with this layout that they will change in the opposite sense because they're at right angles to each other. Um, and they're looking for a shift in the path length and therefore a difference in the arrival time back at the central observatory of the laser light. Uh, that corresponds to a change in the path length of one one hundredth of the width of a proton, which is incredibly <laughs> tiny. Um, but amazingly, they've managed to do it. Uh, it was announced in 2016. Now, in fact, they built LIGO first and, and ran it for a while and, and found nothing that was detectable above the noise floor and had to go back and uh, give it an upgrade to LIGO Mark II with more sensitive equipment and more noise isolation for the mirrors and so on, because otherwise they were being disrupted by the passing of trains 10 miles away um, that were causing more shaking of the equipment than uh, the gravity waves themselves. 
They also built two of them, one in the uh, southern United States in Louisiana and one up at uh, Hanford in uh, Washington State near Seattle up in the top left hand corner. Uh, so several thousand miles apart and that was so that they could tell if they got the same signal in both that it wasn't of local origin. It must be coming from somewhere much further away and therefore probably out in space. And so after the upgrade they turned it on and here's the data we from Hanford we got this trace from Livingston in Louisiana this trace you put the two together and they fit very very neatly and it is indeed two black holes merging and coming back together and that's the noise I don't know if you can hear that I'll let it run again but the uh, sound can be derived from these wobbles there it is I'll not talk over it this time it starts as a very low note and gets higher here we go so you hear that whoop noise and that was a, a 30 solar mass and a 40 solar mass black hole merging with each other and you would think that would create a 70 solar mass black hole but it didn't it created a 65 solar mass black hole because five solar masses were converted into pure energy by E equals MC squared and carried away as gravity waves. Um, it was many billions of light years away from us and so the signal was much diluted by the time it arrived at Earth, but it was detectable. Let's hear it again. There we go. So that was LIGO. Here they are on, on the map, LIGO Livingston and LIGO Hanford, almost as far apart in the US as you could get. Um, and that separation and the fact there were two of them uh, is very useful, but it really could do with a third observatory, which would allow them to triangulate in 3D and isolate where on the sky exactly things are coming from. And so under construction we have some new observatories and so there's a plan for one in India another LIGO which will give them those three and of course they don't it doesn't matter if the earth's in the way because the gravity waves go straight through the earth so they can be on opposite sides but uh, here's Virgo which is a European effort in Italy and a smaller version GEO here in Germany that have, that have gone operational now. In fact, Virgo is now operational and there's another one being built in Japan. And so the combination of these gives us a excellent distribution of uh, possible orientations and the ability to pin down events coming from anywhere in the universe. So LIGO and Virgo have been operating together for about a year now and between them they've detected uh, more than 50 of these black hole mergers of a range of different sizes from uh, similar to the tens of solar masses of the first case to uh, hundreds of solar masses at the top end and just a few at the bottom. They've also because of the extra sensitivity that having that much longer baseline between the observatories gives them been able to detect many cases of merging neutron stars where you've really only got uh, a couple of solar masses of material involved. So the waves are much weaker. So the next step for all of this observing of gravity waves is going to be LISA, which is a space interferometer. And they're going to launch three spacecraft, which will sit in a large triangle out in space well away from the Earth. And again, shoot laser beams around this equilateral triangle, giving them arms not four kilometers long, but arms a million kilometers long. And so they will be able to make uh, detections of gravity waves of a much longer wavelength. And that'll enable us to start looking at new classes of events. In particular, what's going to be very interesting is to look for the mergers of supermassive black holes that live within the nuclei of galaxies. Most galaxies have one or possibly more than one supermassive black hole with a billion 
or a million solar masses. Uh, the one in the center of the Milky Way is four million solar masses and it's a relatively small lightweight one. Um, but galaxies merge together and inevitably the black holes, their supermassive black holes will end up at the center and eventually they will merge and it will be very, very interesting to detect that. But because of the much larger masses involved and the slower accelerations that result, the uh, dynamics of this mean that the wavelength of the gravity waves will be millions or even billions of kilometers long. And that corresponds to frequencies of uh, less than one hertz, so 0.3 of a hertz down to 0 0.0003 hertz. So we'll have to upscale it quite considerably to put it in the audio range. The ones we're detecting at the moment are naturally um, in the range sort of of uh, hundreds to 10,000 uh, hertz and therefore actually very easy to transform the ripples into an audio signal like we were listening to. So that's uh, coming up, at least uh, spacecraft. But I'd need to go back to a little word about neutron stars just to set the, the scene for the next bit. Neutron stars are the, one of the results of an exploding large giant star, uh, typically giant stars in the range 10 and a half to about 18 solar masses will blow up as a type two core collapse supernova when they run out of fuel. And that's what's happened here in the uh, Crab Nebula, which this animation shows expanding outwards from the center. And in the center there is a neutron star, a collapsed ball of compressed matter that was the core of the progenitor star. The outer layers have blasted away and the center being compressed down to an enormously dense object. Probably has a mass of around one to two solar masses compressed into a ball the size of New York City. And the result of that it is that it's the same density as the atomic nucleus. Um, Put it in uh, human terms, a teaspoonful would weigh one billion tons if you could weigh a teaspoonful of neutron star matter. Quite incredible density. It's had all of the uh, electrons and protons that were making up the, uh, the elements, the hydrogen and so on, compressed together and turned into neutrons and then really collapsed into what is a giant nucleus of element number zero made entirely of neutrons doesn't collapse any further because the neutrons repel each other by a quantum mechanical process, which we won't go into now, uh, but it uh, will sustain a ball of neutrons up to around three solar masses, uh, at which point gravity overwhelms even the neutron pressure that holds these neutron stars from collapsing. And that's when things go on eventually to form a black hole. But the key point about these neutron stars is that they spin very rapidly and they spin because of the conservation of angular momentum as a, a skater goes into a spin and then pulls their arms in. Um, they bring all the mass to the center and they spin up to a much higher rate of spin. And that's what's happened here. The core of the rotating star has shrunk inwards. All the mass is now in the middle. So to conserve angular momentum, the speed has to increase. And the rapid rotation whips up a magnetic field and often that creates a radiation beam um, which spins around because the magnetic field's often not perfectly aligned with the rotation axis, as is the case with the Earth. Um, and a beam of radio waves is shot out along the uh, magnetic axis and if these sweep across the Earth, then we hear the pulses of radiation arriving as the beam points at us uh, repeatedly. And that was discovered by uh, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell here in Cambridge in 1967. On the 28th of November, she was using the radio telescope, not the one behind her, which actually looks like a radio telescope, but this one that looks like a, a farmer growing hops. 
This is the IPS array, um, which was the a design of her, her professor at the time, Tony Hewish. And uh, it's just a lot of wires stuck on sticks in the middle of a nine acre field. Um, you couldn't aim it, you just had to wait for the uh, rotation of the earth to point the thing in the right direction. Uh, but it picked up the signal and here's the trace of the signal. Uh, I know this very well because one of the projects I worked on uh, as an undergraduate at Cambridge was to measure these blips on miles and miles of paper tape very carefully to look for any variation over time of the uh, interval between them. They were coming in at 1.3373 uh, second intervals, that's what each of these blips means, and were so stable. In fact, in uh, 1980, I managed to find no change whatsoever in them, which was the result of uh, weeks of project work, um, down to about 10 decimal places. So stable that uh, they thought they might be artificial in origin originally, and so somewhat tongue in cheek, Jocelyn labelled them LGM1, meaning Little Green Men signal number one. And uh, obviously she didn't actually think that they were going to be the signals of aliens, but they looked so regular that uh, they seemed to fit the criteria. Now we can listen to uh, the sound, not of this pulsar, the first one, but another one that she discovered shortly afterwards. This is the crab pulsar in the crab nebula. If you can hear that noise, it's about 30 per second. So considerably faster spin than the, the first one. But it's by no means the fastest. Some other pulsars spin at other rates. Here's another one, which is perhaps a, a slower one. And you can see the trace and hear the blips, I hope. I stop talking for a moment and see also the flashing of the light because we've caught it in the optical as well down here. I'll stop talking and you can listen. So that's a sound of another pulsar. I've got a third one for you. This one's a, a really fast one. It spins 174 times a second. So that's the result of a millisecond pulsar. Now they make such good clocks because they spin so accurately. You can imagine a two solar mass lump of uh, material spinning maybe 200 times a second will take some perturbing. It's quite an impressive gyroscope after all. Um, and this was uh, utilized on the gold disc that was sent out on the Voyager spacecraft and the, this spidery diagram here shows the Earth and the direction and angle and distance to different pulsars in the universe. And it's basically saying we are here because the idea was if any alien civilization picked up this disk, they would be able to decode the signal um, and the information encoded as little ones and zeros all along the paths here and work out the distance, angle and the timing, crucially, of the pulsars, if they managed to figure out that's what it was. And the key to decoding it is down here. This is a hydrogen molecule and this has got one unit and then the pulsar frequencies are expressed in units of the natural vibration of hydrogen. So not in meters per second and kilograms and all of those sorts of earthly units which we've made up but in something universal related to something uh, that they could uh, independently calibrate against. Very clever idea really uh, as a way of mapping it but based on the idea that uh, the pulsar frequencies are very very much a characteristic that's uh, unlikely to change over time. And so the point is they, they make incredibly good clocks. And the, the latest attempt to try and find any variation in some of them is that we are looking at, at uh, one microsecond of change over a 10 year period, which is one part in 10 to the 
13, one in 10 trillion change. So 13 de decimal digits. No wonder that my attempts with only 10 decimal digits didn't manage to find anything. But this is very interesting because what it gives us is a handle on a number of other pieces of astrophysics. If these clocks are so good, and pulsar timing has already led to some interesting discoveries. We found some binary pulsars where they're orbiting around each other and spiraling in because they're giving off energy in both uh, electromagnetic energy and gravity waves. And we can measure that very, very precisely by looking at the change in the spin and the uh, timing of the arrival of the uh, signals as they move towards or away from us in their co-orbits. They get blue and red shifted, so the pulses arrive either early or late. We've also detected planets orbiting round pulsar neutron stars. And in fact, some of the first planets outside the solar system to be discovered were uh, found using pulsar timing. It's also able to map the effect of gravity through uh, the effect that gravity has on stretching and uh, squishing space. As the uh, pulsar beams are moving through the uh, intergalactic and interstellar medium, if there's clouds of dark matter or other gravitating material in the way, then it will curve and change the uh, timing of the arrival. And so it's being used to try to map the distribution of matter in, in the wider universe. Now, of course, looking at individual pulsars, you do get a number of effects you have to worry about. You have star quakes, uh, which can be quite violent on neutron stars, as shown in the left hand artist impression there of uh, that can suddenly change the spin of a neutron star. The radiation is coming out through the plasma that surrounds the neutron star and effects of the plasma can cause changes. Basically, changes in the, uh, the, the space weather around the pulsar can cause the, uh, the beam to change. And we have to allow for the motion of everything. And I love this animation on the right here. This is the sun and its family of planets viewed from the point of view of uh, someone outside the solar system with the sun hurtling along its path round the galaxy and all the planets making a helical path spiraling around it. And uh, if you're measuring the arrival of the signal from some distant pulsar, you've got to subtract out all the Doppler shifts caused by all of the motions of the sun, the moon around the earth, the earth itself, the perturbations of all the other planets and the movement of the pulsar doing whatever it's doing too. So it gets very complicated to do this. But what has been set up is called the International Pulsar Array which is continuously monitoring 47 different pulsars scattered all over the sky. And by using nearly 50 different sources and dealing with as many of those known errors as we can, we can eliminate some of the residual random errors by working out what the average situation is um, in terms of the overall changes to the arrival times on Earth from different pulsars. And this is, was being done uh, over a period of years using the Green Bank Telescope, which is the one on the left there with the movable dish and the rather curiously uh, placed antenna on an arm there. Um, and the good old Arecibo dish in Puerto Rico, which is not steerable and was only able to point at things that moved in its line of sight directly overhead. And the idea is that you time the arrival of the pulsar signals from this constellation of uh, pulsars all around you and can uh, untangle the resulting signal using uh, sophisticated computer analysis 
to work out what is going on. Now, of course, there's a bit of a problem now. This is Arecibo today. Um, the hurricane went past and snapped one of the cables, which led to a catastrophic chain reaction and the entire antenna receiver fell down eventually, smashing its way through to the ground and completely writing off um, the Arecibo receiver. So I'm afraid that's uh, looking very unlikely to ever get replaced. Um, end of a workhorse that's sort of done so much good for astronomy. But the Pulsar Array was used by a team, um, actually a multinational team, but led to, uh, by the University of Rochester um, called the Nanograv Project. And they took over 12 years of this Pulsar timing data from the IPA, the, 70, uh, the 47 Pulsars, and just in January of this year, they announced that they had detected the background hum of all of the sources of gravity waves that are still ringing around the universe from very deep back in the uh, beginning of time. They've been emitted from nearby sources and ones far away, and they're all passing through the Earth all at once. And so you can look to see if the overall uh, perturbation of the 47 different directions of lines of sight to the pulsar array are all being perturbed in a manner that gives you that quadrupole effect of being squished in one direction and stretched in the direction at right angles. Um, in two dimensions as the thing passes through. And with a three dimensional array of uh, 47 pulsars, giving us this amazing uh, uh, natural uh, telescope, we can observe which direction these gravity waves are traveling and how big they are. It's just a matter of the computer software being able to untangle the fact that they're all arriving at once and all overlapping. Um, but of course, we have fantastic supercomputers and sophisticated software these days that's uh, beginning to do that. Now, there's more work to do to tr start to actually untangle this, but the fact that it's been detected at all is very much a, a world first. And it wouldn't surprise me if this doesn't lead to a Nobel Prize because it's opening the door to a whole new set of observations, another window on the universe to be able to observe things that we've just not been able to see before. Putting it in context, what we're actually doing is taking a step um, along the gravitational wave spectrum. The LIGO and Virgo are here and are able to observe frequencies in the uh, milliseconds to seconds range and the hundreds of hertz, thousands of hertz that are in the audio range. And that gives us the ability to detect things like um, rotating neutron stars, supernovae, and black hole mergers that are not too large. So stellar mass, and maybe a little bit above stellar mass black holes. LISA, the interferometer in space, can measure longer wavelengths and uh, these are going to let us look at supermassive black holes um, in the mergers of galaxies. But some of the really powerful effects of truly enormous black holes merging together are the sort of thing that pulsar timing arrays are going to be able to reveal to us. And right down at this end is the good old cosmic microwave background radiation, which actually shows us some of the really long, uh, slow moving, uh, slow changing gravitational waves right down at this end of the spectrum. So the pulsar timing array very much completes our uh, coverage of uh, the spectrum of possible gravity waves from milliseconds down to uh, gravity waves that have a wave period of uh, the, the age of the whole universe. And just to illustrate that, the cosmic microwave background studies 
And this was some work carried out by Chris Crow um, and others in Cambridge a few years ago. It's the subject of Chris's PhD thesis. He was looking for the imprint of the primordial gravity waves on that cosmic microwave background radiation, both in terms of the intensity, which is shown in red and blue. And I think you can see that there is a pattern there, but he's also looking at the polarization of that quadrupole movement, which, uh, which orientation the, the stretching and squishing had. And you, that's indicated by the directions of the black lines. And I think it's amazing that they are, uh, the black lines are kind of spiraling around the red blobs to uh, give it in very technical language. And I think this is the beginning of observing some amazing first structure that is perhaps even deeper back in time than uh, we've ever been able to see before. Now, more speculatively, another thing that the International Pulsar Array will hopefully be able to tell us about is cosmic strings, which are loops and ripples in the fabric of space-time. Uh, you hear about them in Star Trek occasionally, and of course there are consequences predicted by some of the versions of string theory, that you will get these very large uh, loops and uh, discontinuities uh, in the fabric of space-time created at the Big Bang, and that as these move and collide with each other and perhaps merge and uh, the loops break and reconnect, they will, in theory, give off very powerful but very long wavelength gravity waves, and we ought to be able to detect these if they are there at all, of course, we don't know that uh, this prediction is going to turn out to be true, but this is something that uh, the idea of looking at the cosmic, mic uh, cosmic gravity wave background may reveal to us. It may also be able to tell us something about the deepest structure of space-time itself, right down to the quantum level. Uh, this is, of course, fundamental because we have these two theories, general relativity and quantum mechanics, which don't play nicely together down at this very fine structure. Quantum mechanics tells us lots of things about what happens at very small scales, uh, and general relativity tends to uh, result in you dividing by zero for the distance between objects or a number very close to zero and getting an infinity in your mathematics and that's bad and some of these infinities we just can't get rid of at the moment but uh, what we need to understand it better is more evidence and it may well be that by studying the cosmic microwave sorry the cosmic gravity wave background I'm so used to saying the other term that we may be able to get a handle on it. And finally, there is uh, ideas that the Big Bang itself may have left its imprint on the uh, gravity wave background, and that even events prior to the Big Bang might have uh, been able to imprint themselves on the structure of space-time. And this is an idea by Roger Penrose of Oxford, uh, who has some amazing theories, uh, one called uh, conformal cyclic cosmology, which basically says that big bangs are followed one after another in turn, um, and that it may be possible to see the gravity wave ripples from a preceding era through the singularity of a Big Bang out into the next era. And even that some of these pictures on the right hand side here are showing evidence of ripples caused by the gravity waves from a preceding era, making a series of concentric rings imprinted on the cosmic microwave background. But by studying the cosmic gravity wave background, we will be able to see if we see the same thing by an entirely different measure. 
because some people say, no, this is just statistical noise that you're joining up here um, and that it's not a real thing. And these rings are just random uh, chance alignments, a bit like the canals on Mars, if we remember back to that story. Um, but if we saw the same pattern in the gravity wave background, uh, the gravity wave background and the uh, distribution in the cosmic microwaves of ripples should be completely um, uh, separate independent measures of this. And so if they both show the same thing, then that will very much be the smoking gun that perhaps Roger Penrose is onto something. So a very interesting field. And I think uh, the first step announced in January is soon going to be followed by a whole lot of new discoveries. Thank you very much for listening this afternoon to that hot news. And uh, we'll be back again next Saturday with another interesting topic.